I am very pleased to welcome you all to today's event titled Approaches, Experiences, and Opportunities for Measuring Performance in Green Growth Transition at the Global, Regional, and National Levels, hosted by GGGI as part of the Global Clean Growth Week. GGGI's annual global conference designed to promote knowledge sharing on the green growth agenda. Before we start and before I give the floor to our presenters, I would like to give a few housekeeping details. The first point is that while GGGI is pleased to host the event and provide support for the events, the content and opinions expressed are those of the presenters. Second, I would like to remind our presenters to keep your microphone on only during the presentation and on mute when not speaking. We also ask other participants to please mute your microphone during the presentations. You will have the chance to switch on your videos and raise questions verbally during the panel discussion and Q&A. In the meantime, please feel free to leave your questions or comments in the Q&A board or chat room. Third, please note that the event is being recorded and that the recordings will be available on the event website after GGG week. Okay, so before we start with our presenters, GGGI's president and chair, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon is going to share with us his special remarks. Excellencies, distinguished participants and guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome all of you to this year's Global Green Growth Week, organized by the Global Green Growth Institute. Your participation is evidence that we, the global community, demand climate action. And I want to thank you for doing your part to drive and empower green growth. The climate crisis is perhaps the defining crisis of our times. Every year, we can read and hear more and more about the devastating impacts of extreme weather systems. And this year is proving to be one of the worst years yet with the record floods, the droughts and the heat waves all of which lead to displacements from homes, food crises, and wildfires that disrupt and destroy the lives of millions. We are destroying our hope for a better future, and we need to work together to save our planet. I'm pleased to know that so many of you are coming together to exchange ideas, solutions, and best practices on how to advance the implementation of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the framework which I helped establish during my time as the Secretary General of the United Nations. I'm especially pleased to know that many of you are joining from all corners of the world, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and the Pacific, and many of the solutions to be discussed are coming from women and indigenous communities who are most affected by climate change. I encourage you to take full advantage of Global Green Growth Week and engage with one another as green growth champions and practitioners. The climate crisis will require collaboration and collective action from each and every one of us because climate change knows no borders and climate change does not discriminate based on race or social class. We can transform our economies and societies and live a better future, a sustainable and inclusive future only if we work together. The challenges will be difficult and there are no shortcuts. But if we work together urgently, I think we can do it. As I have said before, 
there is no plan B because there is no planet B either. I hope you will join me to make the world a better place for future generations. I wish you very fruitful and successful events during Global Green Growth Week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ban. Now to give his welcome remarks, I am honored to introduce Mr. John Simuko, Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Green Economy and Environment in Zambia. He's an agricultural engineer and holds postgraduate qualifications in environmental science and applied communication science. Before his appointment as Permanent Secretary, he served as Director General of the Zambia Environmental Management Agency between 2016 and 2021. Prior to this, he spent 23 years serving at senior level in local and international private and civil society organizations. John has provided consultancy services to the government of Zambia, the United Nations system, Pan-African organizations in the sub-region, and other international organizations. Mr. John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me um, thank the President of the Assembly and Chair of the Council for the Triple GI, Mr. Ban Ki moon, for his welcoming remarks. Um, let me also thank Your Excellencies uh, joining us uh, in this session, um, as well as the Director General of the Triple GI. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen from across the globe, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this uh, session, which will focus on the approaches, experiences, and opportunities for, the, for measuring performance in green growth transition at the global, regional, and national levels. Many countries today desire to migrate from high to low GHG emission economies in order to improve the quality of lives of their people. We are all committed to meeting the SDGs and commitments related to the Paris Agreement, among others. Now, in order to achieve these targets, we need to measure progress. Against this backdrop, in 2019, the Triple GI launched the Green Growth Index for purposes of measuring performance. This composite index has four main dimensions, namely efficient and sustainable resource use, natural capital protection, green economic opportunities, and social inclusion. In Zambia, the triple GI is collaborating with the government of Zambia to develop um, the green growth strategy. And uh, uh, this method has been applied uh, in doing so. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you all to this discussion and I wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. John, for your very insightful welcome remarks. And we also thank you for gracing us with your presence here in Seoul. Now, without further ado, let me introduce to you our first speaker, who is also the lead organizer of today's session, GGGI's very own Dr. Lilibeth Acosta, Program Manager of the Green Growth Performance Measurement in GGGI. Lilibeth, over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Maurice, for the introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants from different parts of the world. So I just checked that uh, we have now about uh, 40 participants joining us. Uh, we will be able to see you later in the list after the presentations. So you can join the uh, panel discussion as well. So, but first allow me to present you the overview of the concepts and applications of GGI's Green Growth Index and Tools. So is this, this is the framework of the Green Growth Index. It has four green growth dimensions, efficient and sustainable resource use, green economic opportunities, social inclusion, natural capital protection. The dimensions are closely interlinked through four concepts, low carbon economy, resilient society, ecosystem health, and inclusive growth. Each dimension has four indicator categories. For example, for green economic opportunities, we have green investment, green trade, green employment, and green innovation. When we apply the framework for green growth assessments, we identify suitable indicators depending on the context, on the context that we are trying to assess. So we developed the framework from 2017 to 2019 through various approaches, including stepwise, iterative and systematic, and among and most importantly, participatory. So that behind the framework are actually lots of experts. So we have regional experts represented by government officials from about 30 GGI member countries. In 2019, we also formed the International Expert Group with members from various international organizations. And all these experts, including those from the governments, continue to support the development as well as the publication of the Green Growth Index particularly the Global Green Growth Index. This is the first application of the framework. The first Global Green Growth Index was published in 2019, and we are updating this every year. Last year, we were able to publish our first regional Green Growth Index, and this was for the OECS region. After my presentation, you will hear from our colleagues from the OECS Commission together uh, with their partner from the UN ECLAC about the Regional Green Growth Index, which we call Green Blue Growth Index, and the work that they are doing to further improve the database for the OECS region, which will then help to further improve the OECS Green Blue Growth Index in the next years. This year, we have also developed the Green Growth Index at the national level, for example, in Zambia. You will also hear presentation on the Zambia Green Growth Index today. And uh, the different applications that you will see uh, are also very participative. And those are the things that we are going to highlight to you particularly in the presentation of the Zambia Green Growth Index. In addition to the application of the framework for the Green Growth Indices, we are also applying it uh, to the Green Growth Simulation Tool. The tool is able to assess SDG co-benefits because it is highly linked to the Green Growth Index, particularly the Global Green Growth Index, where most of the indicators that we are using are SDG indicators. So the tool can be used to assess the impact of policy measures and green investments on the values of the SDG indicators from 2000 to 2050. So these are scenario assessments. Since uh, last year, we have started uh, rolling out the application of the simulation tool. You can see examples here. This year, the results of the SDG co-benefits assessments for Burkina Faso and Ethiopia are included in the low emission development strategies. Finally, 
We also have the Green Recovery Index, where we have also applied the framework for the Green Growth Index to assess the impacts of the green recoveries and plants in many countries. So as a summary, the Green Growth Index framework is quite versatile. So we are applying it in many countries and we are applying it in different tools and collaborating with many partners. But the main objective of GGI in the application is to support the governments in developing their green growth strategies, national development plans, low emission developments, and other policy documents in order for them to consider green growth transition in all their policies. With this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I would like to uh, also take this opportunity to thank my uh, uh, GGPM team for the support that they're giving uh, for the work in this project. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Lila Beth. It was inspiring to see how the Green Growth Index is being applied to various programs here in GGGI. Okay, we have now move on to our next set of presenters uh, who will share with us experiences in advancing a data knowledge system for green blue growth in the OCS. First to speak is Mr. Chamberlain Emanuel, Head of Environmental Sustainability Division in the OECS Commission in St. Lucia. He has over 20 years of practical experience in leading regional and national programs and projects for sustainable development in Eastern Caribbean small island developing states. Joining Mr. Chamberlain in this presentation is Ms. Georgina Alcantar Lopez, Head of Environment and Climate Change Statistics Unit in the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean in Mexico. Um, Ms. Georgina has more than 25 years of experience in environment information, statistics, and indicator to support the formulation of explicit geospatial policies. Mr. Chamberlain and Ms. Georgina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nera. Thank you very much for this introduction and the opportunity to present with my colleague and friend, Georgiana. And so we're going to present on, on this, what is entitled Advancing a Data and Knowledge System for Green Book Growth in the OECS. So in the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States as a small island states, we have what is referred to as the St. George's Declaration of Principles for Environmental Sustainability, which was formed over 20 years ago. And the foundation of this framework, which guides all the work we do related to environment, whether it be climate change or biodiversity, et cetera, is the island systems management approach. And it's an approach that recognizes our situation as, as islands, the closeness and the, um, of our various ecosystems on the land and going into our marine space. And so we have integrated um, ecosystems, we have interconnected sectors, cross-cutting issues, and multi-dimensional interventions. So simply put, what happens on the land affects the sea and vice versa. And so we really cannot separate um, sectors and, and issues and, and, and stakeholders. Everything needs to happen in a very collaborative way. Now, we have also, based on the agenda of the St. George's Declaration, we have uh, synthesized the work um, that we are advancing through the framework you see on the right hand side. The foundation of it is this island systems management, and it is championing healthy and productive natural capital. And that allows us to, to promote two important priorities, 
The A, which is advancing sustainable economy approaches that are green, blue, and circular, and building resilience in ecosystems, communities, and sectors towards our ultimate vision of a better quality of life for the people of the OECS. And that requires strong institutions, sound intelligence, and smart investments. So just wanted to put this out first so you understand exactly um, why we do our work. And so, as I mentioned, um, more sustainable economy approaches and the green and the blue, we have developed uh, and agreed and approved by our, our member states a green blue economy strategy. And this strategy um, promotes climate resilience, sustainable domestic production, um, involving the prosperity for the entire population, uh, ensuring that it addresses the needs of our most vulnerable, it is inclusive, and very importantly, re includes responsible management of our resources and our decisions to be transparent and participatory. And so you can see the various elements here for um, what the strategy promotes for implementation is to mainstream uh, into national development policies, the implementation requires uh, reform, investment, governance, and financing, and importantly also um, of inclusion, review and assessment, and monitoring. So with that said, you, as, as Lilibeth would have indicated in an introductory uh, presentation, we have collaborated with the Global Green Growth Institute to, to customize the Green Growth Index into a Green-Blue Growth Index. Because again, for us as islands, the blue is very important. But again, we cannot really separate the green and the blue. They are both working in a very integrated way. And so we've been able to introduce additional parameters into the index that ensure it captures both the green and the blue elements and to monitor whether we are making progress towards this green blue economy strategy I outlined. Now, as Lilibeth indicated in the structure, in the framework of the, of the index, it is very data intensive. However, in our subregion, we are data poor. We we struggle with data, and so we we for the for the index to really work for us, we need to ensure we deal with this data gap, and this is where our partnership with the UN ECLAC comes in. We are pursuing, and we have the mandate from our Council of Ministers, our member states, to pursue uh, this roadmap which um, towards addressing the, the data that is required for decision-making, and that would also help the, the assessments of, that are done through the index. And so this roadmap has three components or three clusters. One is content, assess, content assessment, that is what data is available. Secondly, structuring and governance arrangements, which in in, to ensure that uh, at the national level, we have the structures and the capacity to make it happen. And the logistics, that is ensuring that there is a system that can collect and, and make the data accessible and process it. We, through the, through the UNA CLAC and, this, and the statistics division, uh, we are applying the ESAT, and Georgiana will tell you in a while what this is, which helps us to to deal with um, the, the first cluster as well as the second cluster. And we also have a complementary initiative um, called the IWICO with Jeff, which is also helping with the second cluster and will seek to establish an actual system. And so this, um, what we refer to as the environmental information system will seek to um, work into towards enhancing the generation 
collection and systemization of environmental information in the Eastern Caribbean. And this is the framework that we are using to ensure that is in place. So I would now invite Georgiana to go a bit deeper into the, the ESAT and the work that we've done and the work that lies ahead. Georgiana, over to you. Thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, the last slides uh, about uh, our close relationship and, and close coordination with the OECS in the Caribbean countries. Uh, one of the one part uh, that this collaboration is with the framework to the Escazú Agreement. So, as you know, the Escazú Agreement. One of the most important thing uh, behind this uh, agreement is to to give to have uh, better information for make better decisions and these decisions in the environmental context. So at the end, as, as Mr. Emmanuel and of course, uh, Dr. Acosta in the last uh, presentation, you know that the better, better decisions is possible with, we, with we, sorry, when we have uh, better information and enough information. But it is, what is the situation in the Latin American and the Caribbean countries? The, the situation in general is that we not we don't have enough information and maybe or in almost in in all all cases uh, we don't know we don't know exactly what uh, what is the kind of inver of information that we have and in the environmental information is maybe the the critical situation so what is the uh, what is the the role of the ESAT uh, to construct better indicators in the env environmental context. Before that, next slide, Cumberland, please. Uh, for this uh, exercise and the collaboration with, with OECS is also uh, in, the, in the framework with, uh, in the framework of uh, 12th range of the United Nations Development Account. Uh, name it uh, Caribbean Seeds Relevant Climate Change and Disaster Indicators for Evidence-Based Policies. And this, uh, this project is in a clack with the collaboration with the Statistics Division, the Subregional Office of the Caribbean, and the collaboration of Sustainable Development and Human Settlements Division. These uh, three the offices on the CLAC are joined with the OECS, in the framework of this project. And of course, we have also uh, uh, other partners like UNSD, uh, the um, Secretariat, Secretariat of Escazú Agreement, CARICOM. Uh, recently, uh, we are uh, uh, starting, join, uh, starting working with uh, Paris 21 and CIDEMA in the region, in the Caribbean region. Next, please. What is the, the ESAT? Uh, ESAT is a uh, tool developed for United Nations Statistics Division and, and the collaboration with the collaboration of the expert group of environmental statistics. In fact, in, this, in these days, in this week, the, the expert group of environmental statistics is, uh, is having uh, their annual meeting at the same time that this meeting is true, um, but okay. The tool, this tool, this ESAT, is a questionnaire to be used as a guide for a multi-stakeholder multi consultation and discussion process to identify the current state of play of environmental statistics in the country. This tool it, uh, uh, allows identify the relevance, priorities, and availability, and of course, assessing the data gaps. As, as Chamberlain said in the last, uh, slides. Uh, SATS has two parts. In the part one uh, is a diagnosis of the institution, institutional dimension and the second part is the assessment of the statistical level uh, available in each country. The purpose of ESAT is to assess the national relevance, availability, and source of the individual statistics contained in the basic set of environmental statistics. This is a basic set uh, selected to the FDS uh, that is a framework uh, for develop a statistic, uh, environmental statistics, sorry, develop again for, for the Uni United Nations Statistics Division. Um, ESAT uh, allow us to ident identify relevant quantitative and qualitative data gaps 
and uh, allow us also construct a baseline to the develop of a plan for filling these gaps and strengthening uh, environmental statistics according to the national priorities, needs, and available resource. One important thing to say about the ESAT is not only is not the use for climate change and disaster information, it's also for the whole uh, topics environmental related to the environmental. So with this uh, characteristic, it's a strong tool to identify the possibilities to each country to attend the international uh, agendas uh, like, like SDGs, uh, Sendine Framework, Paris, uh, agreement, Paris Agreement, et cetera. Next, please. <clears throat> One of the most important results uh, across our uh, project in the, in the Caribbean is um, the, uh, the result with the assets for these eight countries. The project is uh, focused in eight countries like um, Suriname, St. Lucia, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, Dominica, St. Vincent and the Granadines, Granada and Belize. And in these countries, we uh, apply this uh, ESAT and identify the main gaps between the, avail the uh, information available. The ESAT is uh, organized, organized, yes, in six components. Uh, uh, first, environmental conditions and quality. Second, environmental resources and their use. Uh, third, uh, residuals for extreme events and disaster. Five, human settlements and environmental health. And six, environmental protection management and engagement. The graph at the right of the uh, screen show the main uh, availability data for each one of these uh, components. As you can see, the best represented in, in the information, the best uh, coverage of that information is on the uh, component four about extreme events and disaster. And the, the, the minor presences is on the, the component three about the res residuals. So we uh, in these countries, we have the main gap around the information available to the management of our waste. Of course, uh, we need to uh, improve the information about the environmental resources and their use, and wh what is the link, uh, the linking with the uh, economic activities. And uh, um, always appear that is not enough. Ne uh, in these countries, is need is a is a need. Yes, is a need identify and diagnose the environmental conditions and the quality of their environment. Next, please. At the end of this, apply the, the, the ESA tool. Of course, we can identify the gaps about the, the, the data and about the statistics. So uh, the, the best response to uh, filling this gap is a uh, strategy the data sharing, uh, create data documentations culture, standardize the collection data, ensure the continuity in data collection, need to promote environmental statistics, human change and disasters, climate action priorities, increase use of environmental statistics in policy making, making and rise awareness of national data sources about data requirements. With the purpose of addressing data gaps, it is recommended to follow them this manner. In the short term, short term, make all statistics comparable. In the medium term, start filling data gaps. And in the long term, ensure that all statistics conform international standards. And I think is the last slide. So uh, as, you, as you can see, the main uh, goal of this project is to strengthen the country, the Caribbean countries to to get to get or for a show, ensure better data for data uh, indicators and better uh, decision making in the Caribbean countries. So thank you, thank you, Chamberlain. Thank you, and over to you, Nero. Thank you, Chamberlain and Georgina. That was quite a comprehensive presentation. Uh, for those who are interested, uh, the joint OECS GGGI publication 
that Lilibeth and Chamberlain mentioned in their presentation is available on the GGGI website and the Green Growth Index website. So I, I, I'm happy to share the link in the chat room shortly. Moving on, I would like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Francis Pampi, National Coordinator of the National Designated Authority for the Green Climate Fund and Adaptation Fund. He is a forester and holds postgraduate qualifications in statistics for environmental policy, project planning, and management and business administration. Mr. Francis, the floor is yours. Your microphone is on mute, Francis. Uh, let me try to unmute from my end. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay. Are you able to get me? Okay. I need to share my screen with you. I hope you're able to see my screen. Are you able to see it? Uh, no. Do you want to okay. try that again? Yeah. Let me try again. <clears throat> we can also share our uh, yeah. representation you from... You can, okay. you can share it from that end. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my presentation will basically speak to the process that Zambia is currently undergoing with regards to the uh, Green Growth Index. And I think uh, in the opening remarks, uh, it was alluded to the fact that uh, we are working with GGI, uh, Triple GI, to develop the Green Growth Index for Zambia. And this is a key component in the work that uh, that is going to feed into the Green Growth Strategy for Zambia. Now, we, we are coming from a background where we have always looked at issues of environment to be a cardinal and also issues of ensuring that uh, the aspect of green growth is mainstreamed in the development process. And the green growth strategy that we are working on will be, I think, our first in the country, but also it, it, it will resonate very closely with the national development plan that uh, is currently in place, which, is, which was launched this year. Uh, you can take me to the second uh, uh, slide. Basically, these are the activities that uh, we have done so far, and, uh, and I'll be able to speak to them in detail. Uh, suffice to mention that this process is being done uh, with the participation of different experts, and these are drawn from different government institutions. Also, the research institutions are involved to make sure that uh, whatever will come out will speak to the different aspects of the economy. Next, please. To start with, we had the first webinar, and the objective of the first webinar was just to create awareness uh, on the stepwise approach with regards to the development of the uh, Green Growth Index. Um, I think the, the whole team was taken through the process from the issue of uh, uh, conceptual framework up to the point where we are looking at applications. So the first aspect in the awareness was to look at uh, the participatory approach. We looked at the indicators. We looked at uh, the analysis that should be done and also the ranking, and finally, what will be contained in the report. So basically, this was the introduction. And this, we this webinar had two objectives. So I've spoken to the first objective. We can move to the next slide. The other objective of the first webinar was to build capacity with regards to understanding the framework of Green Growth Index. And I, and I think uh, Lilibeth did speak to 
the the framework. Also, I think in the welcome remarks, this aspect was brought out, uh, and I'll, I'll not dwell much on that. But this is what was introduced, and uh, the team with, was taken through to just get an appreciation and also a full understanding. So that when the process commences, they have this understanding in the background, and they are able to apply that. Uh, you can take me to the next uh, slide. After the first webinar, we had uh, an online survey. And the objective for the online survey was to familiarize the experts with the Green Growth Index, which GGI had suggested for the National Green Growth Index for Zambia. And uh, there was another objective for the online survey. And this is, uh, we can move to the next slide. This was also to allow the team to select or to, to give feedback on the policy relevance of the, just, of the indicators that we are suggested. Now you notice that uh, more than 300 indicators we are looked at and a total of 80 out of these we are selected uh, to be relevant. And I think as the, like in the previous uh, presentation, the issue of data uh, does kick in and become uh, a key ingredient when you're looking at the indicators that you are going to apply. So we can move to the, to the next. This, uh, after these uh, events, we had the first workshop. Uh, the workshop was held over a space of two days and the objectives were to discuss the relevance of the green growth index to the Zambian context. Now we are trying to move from the whole concept and now getting to the specifics. So we are trying to localize and see what is it that applies to our uh, setup in Zambia. So this was one of the objective in the first workshop and what you see there are the different are the experts that are drawn from different sectors who are joining in to uh, get that appreciation and also have the engagement with regards to the same. The second objective, I think I would ask that I moved to the next slide. The second objective of that workshop uh, was to vote and agree on the indicators. And in an event that uh, there are indicators that we could not agree on, suggest new indicators which could be included in the green growth index and this was done uh, in the first workshop uh, in that two days and uh, just to mention that uh, what you see i think in that presentation is just an example of the fact that the 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 voting was done using the mentimeter and uh, what we got were the results of what uh, the experts, uh, given their understanding of the various fields, felt was relevant. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide. Then we had uh, the second uh, online survey. Uh, this one, it was uh, basically aimed at collecting feedback on the proxy variables uh, that were selected to replace the indicators that did not have sufficient data. I remember I had uh, referred to the previous uh, presentation uh, regarding the relevance of data when it comes to indicators. And in this case, that had to be taken into consideration. And in this second online survey, it was uh, the issue that was trying to be addressed. We can move to the next slide. Then we had the next webinar. Basically, the next webinar was trying to bring out the preliminary results of the Green Growth Index. And those uh, figures that you see there are basically just showing the results of the, the, the showing the preliminary results. Uh, I'll, I'll request that maybe we move to the next slide. 
And the other objective was also to get the feedback on the targets to be used for the indicators that uh, did not have SDG targets. So we looked at these and the, the team had to respond and give feedback on those uh, SDG, uh, on, on the indicators that did not have the SDG targets. I, I must indicate that this process has been uh, so engaging. It has been uh, a, a dialogue. It has involved the experts. So the experts uh, engage with the GGI team and the GGI team will give the uh, guidance on different aspects and then the team will respond to that and try to also seek guidance and clarity on certain issues. It, it has, uh, uh, on the flip side of it, uh, it is helping to build capacity of the local team of experts. It, it's been a worthwhile experience on the part of Zambia and we feel it has come at the right time. So we, we can move to the next slide. Then we had the second workshop. Uh, so this, this is the series of uh, the activities that we've had. So in the second workshop, there was uh, the issue of presenting the website, which was showing the final results of the National Growth Index as one of the objectives and the other objective. So what you see there is just showing the summary of results from what we, we had been working on as a team. We can look at the second uh, objective. The other one was capacity building on the interpretation of the results of the National Green Growth Index. Uh, the, you will notice that, uh, and agree with me, that the issue of understanding uh, and also being able to read and interpret the results is very cardinal because when you have not understood the indicators, it becomes a challenge for you who is uh, preparing or working on the on on the on the assignment. Uh, I think those of you that are able to zoom in, I'm sure you'll be able to see me there as one of the participants in the top uh, top right corner in a blue shade as a participant attentively. Uh, listening and actively engaging with the other colleagues. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide. Having done that, uh, we now look at uh, what is it that remains going forward. Uh, so we have the activities that are remaining and um, these activities involve dissemination of the National Green Growth Index website, uh, preparation of the National Green Growth Index report, review of the report, publication, and also the issue of uh, capacity building uh, and also updating the uh, National Index. And these have got different timelines uh, running all the way into 2023. Now, in between, the dissemination and also uh, what was done last is the bouncing off of these indicators to senior management um, in the Ministry of uh, Green Economy, who have to also appreciate because the Ministry of Green Economy is the one working with uh, other ministries, uh, such as Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Energy, um, all those ministries that have a key role to play when it comes to green growth of uh, uh, working uh, to develop the strategy. So uh, we have to bring the ministry, the leadership in the ministry to speed with this process so that they are also able to articulate the issues in the different fora that they do participate in when it comes to uh, uh, explaining the green growth index for Zambia and how it relates to the green growth strategy and the fact that it is a very important component to that. Uh, so far, this is what we have done as Zambia, and uh, we are looking forward to completing this whole process and have the report published. Uh, 
uh, basically that is what I had to present in terms of the process for Zambia. I think the next slide should be just to say thank you to all and thank you for listening. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Okay, thank you, Francis. I'm sure our colleagues in countries are inspired by Zambia's experience, and we look forward to seeing the Zambia Index Report getting published soon. Um, so now we move to our last set of presenters. We are happy to be joined by our colleagues in our country offices in St. Lucia and Zambia to share with us their experiences in facilitating collaboration with governments and partners in the context of measuring performance in green growth transition. First to present is Dr. Christine Dizon, Caribbean representative in GGGI St. Lucia. Um, second to present is Ms. Angela Nantulia, country lead and project lead for Zambia GCF Readiness. And after the two presentation, I'll hand over the floor to Lilibeth to lead on the panel discussion and Q&A. Dr. Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Kristen Deason. I'm the Caribbean representative at GGGI, which means that I lead our programs in the Eastern Caribbean. And I don't know if this was mentioned previously, but uh, OECS, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, which is the organization that uh, Chamberlain, who spoke earlier, is with, is actually the only member of GGGI that is a regional organization. So we have kind of a unique structure. Um, to our program here. So as uh, Chamberlain and Georgina and Lilibeth spoke on earlier, GGI and the OECS Commission collaborated on a framework for measuring green blue growth performance in the OECS region based on the existing green growth index. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process that we went through on that project, facilitating collaboration with governments and partners. And you'll see it's actually quite similar to that that was presented uh, for Zambia in the previous presentation. So we clearly have a consistent approach. Uh, so this project, again, it was a, just an initial project, a pilot project about uh, one year long that we're hoping to build on. And we wanted to make sure we did a lot of outreach with stakeholders to make sure we had their buy-in and engagement. So one of the first things we did was a presentation at the OECS Council of Environmental Ministers meeting. This is a meeting that happens every year of the ministers from each of the OECS member states. So we did a couple of different things. We had submitted a, a technical paper and a presentation with an overview of what we plan to do. This event was during COVID, so it was just virtual, but we also had a, um, a there was a virtual exhibition and we had a virtual booth. That's what this picture is here. So it was kind of fun. Um, some interesting virtual techniques were used in, in that event. And at that uh, presentation, we received endorsement of the approach. So we went forward with the work as proposed. Uh, similar to Zambia, we had a, a series of webinars throughout the year last year in 2021. The first one was an introduction and an overview of the project and what we hope to do, mainly aimed at government stakeholders, technical staff, um, as well as policymakers and leaders. And you can see some pictures of the various events on the, on the right side here. The second webinar, we had it jointly with ECLAC. Uh, uh, Georgina and Chamberlain spoke earlier about the ESSET project. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't contribute to stakeholder fatigue, right? Stakeholders being asked for similar information multiple times. So we teamed up uh, with the ECLAC team on that event, gave an update on what we were working on, what had been done so far, and gave an overview of the data validation process. And actually subsequent to that workshop, um, worked in partnership with ECLAC to collect the data that we needed in order to calculate the index for the pilot countries. Um, the index was calculated for St. Lucia, Grenada, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, although other OECS countries didn't have sufficient data, unfortunately, which is why one of the reasons why we need to work on getting additional data. So the third webinar in the series, we presented the preliminary results and also presented uh, the simulation tool which simulates the possible 
uh, effects of various policies on the indicators in the index. Finally, we presented again this year at the same meeting I mentioned earlier, the Council of Environmental Ministers. This time it was in person, which was excellent. We discussed the initial results. We presented the technical result, uh, sorry, the technical report that was mentioned earlier. I'm not sure if that link was put in the chat, but we'll make sure that happens. And there's also a website that summarizes the, the data and the information. So I can provide that link as well. And we also discussed the next step. So next steps, uh, this was mentioned a little bit earlier, but again, we'd like to further refine uh, the calculation of the green growth index for the region, being able to calculate it for some of the countries that we weren't able to cover in the pilot, and also gathering additional data, even for the countries that we did calculate it for, because even for those countries, there were some indicators that we didn't have, and we calculated the index as, as best we could based on the data that we had, but being able to get additional data will allow us to um, have better uh, accuracy, I would say, in, in terms of the index and make sure it covers all the areas that we intended to cover. We'd also like to use the results to spark policy dialogue and analysis, because of course the, re the reason we're calculating these indices is to understand where we are in terms of green growth so that we can figure out where we want to go. And that can give us an indication of areas where countries may be weaker, where there's more opportunity to, to make an impact. We'd also like to use the simulation tool to assess policy options for improving green-blue growth indicators. So once we start this policy dialogue, GGI has developed a simulation tool that allows us to look at different scenarios and help give us an idea of what the effect of certain policy um, instruments that are proposed could have on the index itself, as well as to the, the impact that those policies will have in the real world, which is of course our, our ultimate objective. Just to give you a couple examples of the type of policy analysis that I'm talking about, some uh, two projects that we've done in the Caribbean region. The first one is an analysis of fossil fuel subsidy reform in St. Lucia. So I'll just give a brief description of this. And uh, there's also a report that's pictured here. I can also put the link to that in the chat after I finish speaking. So basically the government of St. Lucia still provides direct subsidies for some fossil fuels. However, it was thought that these were perhaps causing overconsumption of fossil fuels as well as putting pressure on public budgets and increasing emissions of greenhouse gases. So the government asked us to help them explore various types of subsidy reform that could be pursued in order to increase government revenues, reduce imported oil products, reduce emissions, and increase investments in other positive areas such as health, education, and, and sustainable energy. So we worked very closely together with government stakeholders to uh, structure these different scenarios and, and modeled what the impacts could be. So under the recommended scenario, that was one of the conclusions, the subsidies would be gradually removed and increased revenues um, reallocated. So our analysis showed that in 10 years, the total national energy bill could be decreased by almost 4% compared to a business as usual scenario. The annual gross domestic product would increase by nearly 2%. CO2 emissions would decrease by over 16%. And we also did a long-term uh, forecast and found that by 2050, the cumulative savings could reach almost 4 billion Eastern Caribbean dollars. So quite a significant uh, impact there. The second one here on the slide is the greenness of stimulus assessment, which um, I, I believe Lula Beth mentioned earlier. This was actually done globally in a number of different GGI member countries, but always yes. Uh, and, and some of the member states of OECS were covered. This basically looked at the uh, COVID recovery stimulus policies that were in place in different countries and assessed them on greenness to see what percentage of the mechanisms in those policies were providing a positive impact on, on green growth and gave us an assessment of where there might be opportunities in the future to further green recovery plans and add policy instruments which provide a positive environmental impact. Uh, so this last slide is, is just an overview of our Caribbean program. If you're interested, I won't go into this in detail because I think I'm out of time, but basically shows our focus areas and the goals of our program. And again, that we very much appreciate our strong partnership with the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and our member state governments. So thank you very much and back to you.
Thank you, Christine. And I think I've already introduced Angela. Let me do that again. <laughs> It'll be my honor. So next to um, present is Ms. Angela Nantulia, our country lead and project lead for Zambia, GCF Readiness. Uh, Ms. Angela, the floor is yours. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, uh, thank you for giving us this time and, and thank you for including uh, Zambia in, in this process of developing their National Green Growth Index and engage, gi giving them multiple opportunities to engage with, with GGGI. Um, uh, I will give a brief um, background. It, obviously, um, despite having engagement with um, Zambia government since about 2018, um, Zambia is now only just in the process of completing membership. So actual physical presence in Zambia only started from the February this year. So it's we're quite an early stage um, physical presence in Zambia, but we're definitely running as fast as we can to get a lot of things up and running. Um, so one of the good things we, we were able to do was that um, following discussions after the COP, uh, meeting last year and Zambia making the very strong uh, signal in terms of setting up a Ministry of Green Economy and Environment. Um, we came in as GGGI to support them in their green economy transition. And one of the best ways for us to do that has been to engage with them in terms of benchmarking um, performance and looking at ways to further integrate um, green interventions and measures into their national development frameworks and um, policy environments and, and start to attract resources for um, interventions. And so we are currently actually providing some support to the Zambian government looking at um, their green growth strategy. And one of the key areas that we've seen um, in terms of supporting analysis and, and having a bit more um, analysis to back up the direction of the strategy was to start the development of the National Green Growth Index. I won't, need, I won't go too much into that because um, Francis has already spoken to it, but we are, um, we have had a very good engagement with stakeholders and it, it was actually really good to see um, stakeholders very engaged in, in terms of trying to identify the indicators and trying to really put a lot of thought and process into, into what um, activities were involved because they were very much interested that this should be a robust um, framework for them to be able to to monitor and and benchmark their green growth um, transition. Um, one of the other things we might we are looking to do is also to support the with the use of the green economy model to analyze um, that we will use to analyze green growth interventions that will allow us to integrate green growth targets for the strategy. And also as part of this, we'd be able to quantify investments as well as resulting growth rates, employment benefits and other benefits for from the strategy. And there's a potential as well for us to link this to the green simulation tool and if possible further on um, look at opportunities to link all of this activity to um, the development of an LT LEDs in the future, particularly as um, we have a project also running here with um, the German government, which is looking at Article 6 and carbon transaction readiness. So um, we would be looking to try and make sure that all the activities that we are, we are supporting the government with are easily linked together to have a much bigger sort of multiply effect in terms of impact and direction. And so we are now in the stages of on completion of the of the index and, and looking at the end game of the, the strategy. We'll also be looking to develop the what would be the GDGI Zambia country program, which is an agreed um, sort of strategy between us and the Zambian government that would now be identifying key interventions and project areas for us to, to support. And there's a multitude of, of areas for Zambia. We're quite excited that Zambia is um, uh, 
is is a little bit of the darling right now when it comes to to interest and and engagement and um, lots of opportunities. So we we look forward to being able to leverage um, the good relationship we have there, but also in terms of leveraging what GGGI's um, sort of more technical. Um, assistance and support can can bring to to guide the country to on their green growth journey and thank you very much for that and thank you for our zambian colleagues for for traveling to korea to to attend it's it's definitely much appreciated and back to you thank you thank you very much angela and of course thank you very much to all these speakers for the very informative uh, uh, presentations that you have done I think uh, our uh, participants have learned a lot, but there are still more to learn because we are now going to the panel discussion. And uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, the experts who we invited to join this panel, who will further give us uh, additional knowledge on the different uh, green growth approaches and the measurement tools and in initiatives uh, to help uh, different uh, developing countries to uh, follow the track of green growth transition. And uh, allow me to introduce to you our uh, panel, panelists for this. Uh, and then maybe while I'm introducing, uh, we can also ask the colleague Martin uh, to slowly uh, uh, promote our attendees to join the panel discussion. Uh, and so we can also see each other while we are discussing. So first, uh, let me introduce uh, Mr. Gerald Samben-Yume. He is the Principal Climate Change and Green Growth Officer in the Department of Climate Change and Green Growth in the African Development Bank Group, or AFDB, in Cote d'Ivoire. Gerald has over 10 years of public and private sector experience in climate change and green growth, and is responsible for supporting AFDB's climate mainstreaming through the application of climate change tools. Our second panelist is Dr. Xu Tian. Uh, we can call her Grace. Uh, she is senior economist in the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation De Department in the Asian Development Bank, or ADB, in the Philippines. Grace works in the teams that produce ADB's flagship reports, including Asian Development Outlook, and Asia Band Monitor. Prior to joining ADB, she was an associate professor of finance at Fudan University in China. And finally, we have Mr. Enrico Bota. He is policy analyst in the Green Growth and Global Relations Division in the Environment Directorate in the OECD in France. Enrico acts as the Green Growth Coordinator at the OECD's Green Growth and Global Relations Division. His work focuses on the design of environmental policies and the analysis of their impacts, including social perspectives. Okay, so uh, let me see. I think we don't have yet all the uh, attendees. Uh, so far, we should have additional. Uh, we have panelists in the list of 22 and attendees 16. Uh, we are waiting for them to be promoted so we, we can also uh, see them, uh, hopefully. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, so let me uh, ask our uh, honorable experts for the uh, question. So maybe we can go first to Gerald, uh, because Asian Development Bank, uh, AFDB or uh, African Development Bank is actually also one of those organizations who have started developing the uh, Green Growth Index as early as 2018. So maybe, uh, Gerald, if you can provide a brief background on the development of African Green Growth Index in 2018 already, specifically what were the objectives for developing the index? Go ahead, Gerald. All right, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Lilibet. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, good afternoon, uh, evening, or whatever you are. So like uh, Lilibet said, uh, the African Development Bank has been developing the African Green Growth Index, but we did not start in 2018, we started in 2015, when we first piloted the first African Green Growth Index, and the index uh, covered 22 out of 54 African countries. And what we found from the index was that uh, 
it was another most panelists have talked about issue of data that was being uh, difficult to have in terms of uh, like monitoring the, the state of green growth in this country. So we also faced the same problem in 2015. We started the African Green Growth Index, and out of 54 countries, we just did 25. 22 countries based on uh, five indicators. Uh, the first indicator was the socioeconomic context and concern of green growth. Uh, the second indicator was, uh, I mean, the dimension was more environmental and social and risk productivity. The third dimension was based on a monitoring, and natural, monitoring the natural assets base. The fifth was on gender, and then the, the fourth was on gender, and then the fifth was on governance. So after a, a thorough review of what we did during the First, uh, Africa Climate Index, it thought it wise that it, it, it is not good. It, it did not cover the whole of uh, the African continent because it was limited in scope. Uh, because Africa has 54 countries and focusing on those 22 countries uh, was not possible. So that is where we, uh, we came to partnership with uh, GGI in 2018 to develop the Second African Green Group Index. And since then, we're working together a little bit to look at peculiar indicators that are uh, for Africa because. When we went through the global green group in the Africa, African region is different from the other regions. And like uh, yeah, as you must know, uh, the, the key issue for Africa is uh, uh, climate adaptation and resilient building. And looking at the global indicator, it focus more on issue of mitigation and resource uh, efficiency. But so we, we are looking at other issues that are peculiar of Africa, like how to mobilize uh, climate finance. So what is the reason for the indicators? We have to bring out the reason for developing the index and one, like I said, to bring out the issue of climate adaptation and resilient building, two, to help African countries to mobilize climate finance, and three, to bring out the issue of green growth into the agenda of African countries. I'm happy to hear that Zim, uh, Zambia is already taking the lead in terms of developing the index. And this done by, because the, during the first index, Zambia performed the, most, the best country in Africa because uh, if it was, uh, the ranking window did not publish the result, but Zambia performed the best because they were already looking at the issue of uh, renewable energy, efficiency, renewable uh, economy, all those things were already there. And so they perform higher than other countries. So I'm happy to present that, that Zambia is doing very well. And that being the multilateral development bank supporting other African countries, Zambia is already taking the lead in terms of where we, what we're supposed to be doing. But look at the continent as a whole. Uh, and that's why we are working with GGI, is that how can we make the African Green Group Index unique for African countries? And, so that is the issue that we are looking at now. And uh, work on the second, uh, work on the revised index is still ongoing. We are not yet published that, that, uh, that work yet because we are still doing a lot of consultation. Because being a, uh, a multilateral development bank, one other issue that we face in terms of ranking countries. And that's why the first result we did not publish because we are concerned that how can we rank African countries? Because you know the issue of uh, Countries want no, most countries don't want to be ranked, especially in Africa. I know in other parts of the world, it's easy to rank countries, but in Africa, it's, it's a different context because countries are still struggling in terms of recognition. So if you start ranking them now, it's been okay, it's like a lot of problems. So that is the reason why we are not able to rank African countries. But we know that the index is very, very important in terms of how to position African countries to mobilize climate finance and also to transition to green growth. Just last year, we developed a, a, a second a climate change framework that involved the policy, a strategy, and actual plan. And Green Group is central into this, into this, into this strategy, into this, uh, into this framework. And all this way, as a result of what we have done before in terms of how we can incorporate Green Group and climate change resilience into our policies and operations. So I think the journey is still there. I think that uh, we, we still have much work to do in terms of bringing together all the stakeholders in terms of uh, how do we bring all African countries together and agree on a common framework on methodology and how uh, what is going to be good for other countries because Africa, Africa is made up of five different regions and are different in their, in their own uh, resource base, they have different economic policies. Are, so, and the issue of the just transition that is coming on now. And so it's a whole big game for Africa. So we are, we are taking our time in terms of how do we how we do the position of the uh, coming of the index for African countries and, and being a multilateral development bank with all the member countries being members of the bank, it's not easy for us to rank them because uh, they're all stakeholders to the, to the institution. So we don't want to, we want, we want to avoid the issue of ranking, but the second most important thing that we want to do going forward is how to have uh, data in terms of developing the index based on peculiarity for Africa. And those, the peculiarity of Africa is about issue of governance, resilient building and climate change adaptation. 
which are key in terms of how the shape, the way the industry is going to be, going to be developed. I think I would like to stop there for now and hand the floor to other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gerald. And uh, yeah, we look forward to continue working on, on the index. We have already started uh, developing the framework uh, uh, two years ago, but uh, we will continue to work together. And uh, I would like now to give uh, the next question to uh, uh, Grace, uh, Dr. Uh, Xu Tian. Uh, well, uh, probably most of you also know, ADB developed and published an inclusive green growth index uh, for the Asia Pacific in 2018. I understand, of course, uh, Grace did not participate in this initiative, but for sure uh, he would be able to provide us a brief background on other innovative development initiatives in ADB to promote green growth in Asia Pacific. So uh, Grace, uh, your the floor is uh, open. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Lily Bess. Uh, yes, uh, actually, the uh, my colleague is uh, is, is uh, helping. I was working on this uh, green uh, inclusive green growth index, and then in EDB, actually, we have different types of services. As you can tell from the name, actually, we are a development bank. So uh, there are uh, initiatives to support green growth by providing innovative uh, financing uh, schemes. So basically, uh, beside providing uh, loans, actually, EDB has a lot of initiatives, and then also uh, innovative financing models is trying to. To, uh, de-risk or um, uh, trying to catalyze more private uh, capital to uh, to direct more capitals into uh, green investments. So that is uh, one types of uh, uh, initiatives. For example, one a very uh, famous one. It's uh, it's known as AC, uh, ACGF. I'm not sure if you uh, know about it. It's uh, the full name is ASEAN uh, Catalytic uh, Green Finance Facility. So under this one, it, of course, it focusing on ASEAN markets. So basically, uh, this kind of ACGF uh, initiatives try to uh, focusing on uh, uh, to, to make the projects, green projects, more bankable, try to de-risk uh, these green investment projects, try to uh, build the capacity of uh, uh, these uh, uh, pro projects from the uh, financier perspective, and then also try to channel private sector investments into these uh, green projects uh, by uh, arrangement that can de-risk uh, these uh, green investments. So, so that's one. At the same time, actually, as uh, I think uh, um, GGGI and, and then also African Development Bank is also doing, ADB is also providing capacity and knowledge uh, support to policymakers and then as well as market players. So, so we, we also have uh, uh, different initiatives uh, to facilitate the market development itself to channel more uh, funding to support uh, the, the green growth. So for example, ADB is supporting an Asian bond market initiative, uh, trying to um, uh, enhance the capa government's capacity to build a green, uh, green finance taxonomies, trying to improve the uh, eco market ecosystem of uh, green finance. So, so we try to uh, support uh, the, the, uh, the develop the market and then letting the market to function uh, and then channel as uh, um, uh, to, to channel the private sector to, to make investment towards green investment. And then at the same time, ADB also conducted a policy support. So basically by a knowledge products and then also the exercise like uh, green index which is, is a very useful exercise to give uh, um, stakeholders worldwide about I mean what drives green growth so where are the areas that can be further done so this kind of policy uh, policy uh, related knowledge products is, is also very helpful. ADB is also doing a lot of uh, policy related support, uh, collaborating with other uh, development partners and then also DMC, developing member country uh, policymakers to working on uh, policy capacity and then also knowledge products to support uh, the green investment, particularly on uh, information related uh, um, work. So for example, I mean, uh, one, key, one key market failure 
during this green growth mode is, is how we can measure this environmental benefit. That is the core issue of the green growth. And then uh, so far, um, in, in terms of the practice, this is still not very, uh, um, very straightforward. And then I think uh, th this is also part of the context where these policies can further make uh, make a contribution and then also, uh, I mean, many research and knowledge products like this uh, uh, Green Growth Index can play a role in. Thanks. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, so for, for our attendees, uh, we also have this Q&A uh, chat room. So if you would like to uh, have some uh, questions uh, to be answered either in the chat room or maybe if you have time to answer later, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. Uh, so now I would also like to ask uh, Enrico, uh, because the OECD is also, also have their uh, uh, measurement tools, which they call green growth indicators. It's not, of course, a composite index, but it's still, it has a, a similar function. So I would like to ask uh, Enrico um, to explain briefly uh, the different components and dimensions of the green growth indicators that we're using uh, in the OECD. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Lili. Uh, thank, thanks a lot to um, uh, GGI for inviting us to this uh, to this event. It's been an extremely interesting conference for me to follow. Um, so, um, as the previous speakers pointed out, green growth is a multi-dimensional transfor transformation, and this requires a number of indicators to capture all the various aspects of the issues we are analyzing. The OECD approach. Um, as you mentioned, is to capture this multidimensionality by using a dashboard of 26 indicators. And these 26 indicators are grouped in four main areas. The first area is environmental resource productivity. Uh, and basically, this indicator reflects the efficiency with which economic uh, or the economies use natural resources. And basically, they, they try to um, answer the question, are we becoming more efficient in using natural resources and environmental services or not? Um, and a classical example is, for instance, the, the output generated by per unit of CO2 emitted, for instance. The second main area is the natural asset base, and this captures whether the natural asset base of countries is being kept constant through the years. Uh, for growth to be sustained, the natural asset base needs to be stable. We don't need to uh, degrade our natural asset base. The third dimension is the um, environmental quality of life. And basically, these are a group of indicators that reflect how the state of the nature uh, affects the well being of people. Uh, and a classical example here is exposure to uh, PM2.5, exposure to air pollution. The fourth uh, group of indicators are uh, the one capturing the economic opportunities and the policy responses. These indicators aim at capturing the basically the economic opportunities associated with green growth and monitoring the policy measures put in place. And so, for instance, under this label, we have indicators on green patents, on the innovation performance at large, but also on the uh, inform on the presence of environmental taxes, subsidies, and their level. And finally, to complement these four main areas, we have uh, indicators on the social economic context. Uh, that kind of complete uh, the picture. And of course, for all of these, uh, all these four areas, the, the OCD dashboard, we are further in, uh, expanding and refining indicators. And so, for instance, the OCD uh, has recently released uh, a database on sustainable ocean economy with the aim of providing data to support policymakers in ensuring that the ocean economy can, or the marine resources can be used uh, in a way that is aligned with the UN 2030 agenda. And I will stop here for this. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Enrico. So uh, actually, I still have uh, uh, one set of questions for, for the uh, panelists. So if you can uh, bear with us just to, to stay five minutes longer, because we still have Ingrid, Ingrid uh, Solva to, to give us a very good uh, and uh, inspiring uh, closing remarks later. I just would like to learn a bit more from our panelists. So if our panelists could please uh, maybe answer uh, the question, uh, not more than uh, two minutes or one minute maybe <laughs> would be possible. So I will go back to, uh, to Gerald first, uh, if you can answer very briefly. Uh, 
what do you think is the value of developing regional green growth index in Africa using a participatory approach uh, similar to the one that we are doing now in Africa? Uh, because uh, so far we have started with more of a desktop research together. And so, uh, so in your view, at the regional level, should we also go at the uh, participatory approach? Uh, please, briefly, go ahead, Gerald. Yeah, thank you, Lily. But I think one of the most important uh, issues concerning that is, uh, like I said, ranking of countries, because I think you bring all the countries together and then uh, seeking the opinion, how do you want to be ranked? I think that's very, very important for us because if we don't go through that particip participatory approach, we will just do things, I'll just publish it and they'll not be happy. So I know one of the key hinders that been affecting us, how do we bring the countries together and then ask the opinion, how to be ranked? Because without that, we cannot publish any report that we're going to, because African region is unique in its way, and countries that want to be ranked, even though when the World Bank uh, doing business reports started publish or started publishing, many countries were not happy, but now they're happy that the report is being published, they're happy to see the progress that they're making. So in terms of uh, participatory approach, I think the most important thing is how the countries should be ranked. That is more important for us. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gerald, for, for being very brief. Now I would like to go back to Grace. Uh, what are the key factors that can support developing Asia? transit to green trajectory. Uh, thanks, Lilibes. I think first of all, we need to get the right policy in place. Uh, so for example, to guide the right, to give the right incentives for the economic uh, activities to shift towards green growth. And then at the same time, we need to, to build the market. So the market has the right infrastructure and then uh, information, and then also the index to monitoring the performance of the environmental performance of, of the economic activities. And at the same time, uh, I think uh, we need to have the right institution and the social norms so that everyone's behavior is, is also uh, towards these uh, uh, green growth and uh, SDG aligned activities. Thanks. Thank you very much, Grace. And finally, uh, Enrico, so are there any challenges in making OECD member countries adopt the green growth indicators in their planning process? Because that's actually our ultimate objective, right? Yes, exactly. Well, I would say there are uh, there's probably two things I would like to say here. First one is, as we said before, green growth is multidimensional, but also it's one of the key challenges of adopting this indicator. Because uh, given this multidimensionality, this multidimensionality, a key challenge is to effectively communicate what the priority areas are for policymaker and the public at large to focus on. Um, so at, at the OCD, we, we try to cope with this by basically uh, using headline indicators, which are represent representative of a broader subset of green growth issues as a key communication tools. Um, and a second challenge of maybe an area of improvement, if you wish so, is that probably we need to become better at measuring the social challenges of green growth. We need more granular data to ensure that you know the transition is inclusive uh, for all. And uh, I will stop here. <laughs> I think you have a very nice closing answer, Enrico, because that will fit very well uh, to the closing remark that uh, Ingvild uh, is going to give to us. But uh, first, I would like to introduce Ingvild uh, to you. So Ingvild Solvang is the Deputy Director and Head of the Climate Action Inclusive Development at TGI. She has more than 20 years of experience in international development and humanitarian work and frequently brings in the gender and social inclusion dimension into GGI's programs across sectors, policies, and investments. She founded and became the first chair of the Gender Expert Group on GGKP a year ago. So go ahead, uh, Ingvil, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Lilibet, for that introduction and for the cue, Enrico, as well, <laughs> in your uh, final conclusion there. So I'll uh, just give a very brief reflection at the end, not trying to summarize or conclude necessarily this very, very rich uh, session. Um, now, uh, as uh, was outlined today, GGGI first published the Global Green Growth Index in 2019 under Lilibet great leadership and, and with her team. And it's really hard to overestimate the value for GDDI and GDDI members to have a robust framework for green growth, uh, which the index actually provides um, uh, as a basis for our definition of green growth. And, and what, what has been outlined today very well by Francis in Zambia and Christian in East, East Caribbean and other presenters today 
is also the importance of, of that consultation process, multiple, multi, uh, multi-stakeholders coming together, the cap- capacity building element of it, really to define what does green growth mean in the national context uh, that we work in. So where do we need to go? Which pathways will take us there? And how do we take stock along the way? And we now, since 2019, have seen the way that this particular index has provided the the Green Goal Index that GDGI developed uh, years ago with lots of consultation from from our partners, has really provided a framework to explore green growth pathways at sector level, sub-national level. We talk about blue, green, and green, blue. Um, And it's uh, it's really a a great uh, framework that enables us to systematically look at how to integrate and embed the green vision into national sustainable development plans more broadly, which I think has been very nicely outlined today. And the framework also pushes ambition. I think it's really fascinating to see because it gives us the confidence to prioritize green, sustainable, and low emission outcomes when we at the same time understand the interlinkages between longer term sustainability and SDG achievements and shorter term socioeconomic co benefits economic growth, poverty eradication, gender equality, job creation, access to services, all of which remain the priority for any government. Um, And the way that the models are becoming increasingly people-centered that Enrico also talks talks about, and we need to do do more to bring people at the center here, is also what communities are concerned with, and consequently also that will lend legitimacy to governments. The social dimensions and projections of co-benefits are hugely important and applying subsets, I think we are talking perhaps now about the sort of these subsets of frameworks for gender just transitions and inclusive growth that we are working on uh, so that we can design policy measures that levels the playing field to ensure that the co-benefits are equally distributed between men and women by, for example, addressing the barriers that inhibits women's full participation in labor markets, in formal sectors of the economy, and in leadership positions in green industries that uh, sometimes are traditionally dominated by men. Um, the approaches and tools that we have discussed today, I think, uh, are really uh, helping us visualize the need also to focus our attention on the most vulnerable and disadvantaged communities that must be, in fact, equipped with skills, land tenure, financial inclusion, to fully benefit from green transitions. And I think what has struck me today in the, in the session is also how these frameworks, uh, approaches, and the tools that you've discussed today really work some magic, uh, literally, in, in turning complicated matters into complex matters. If you can see the difference there, where, where, we, where we think about things being complicated, it's something heavy and problematic. But when we look at complexities, I find that much more stimulating. It's a stimulating challenge that we can deal with systematically, uh, deliberately and creatively. And I have have heard it raised a couple of times during this week and the different sessions at the the Global Green Growth Week um, uh, that uh, we need systemic approaches to tackle the complexities of multiple planetary crises, climate, biodiversity, desertification, pollution, waste, COVID-driven socioeconomic setbacks, et cetera, et cetera. And the transformational models presented today, I think, really help us move from the siloed approaches to tackling these challenges to more systemic and systematic ways of integrating complex solutions. And knowing the scope and scale of the challenges, uh, the resources required to succeed is exactly really, really depending on these robust and science-based approaches that you have developed and provided us with and presented here today, because it gives us also that evidence that our solutions work or not, uh, or need to be adjusted. And so perhaps after all, in our conclusion, I I think I I would would like to say uh, simply that perhaps this was the most important session at the Global Green Growth Week in 2022. Uh, And on behalf of GDVI, I sincerely wish to thank all of you for your collaboration, contributions, and participations, and congratulations on a very uh, well-done session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ingvild. And so I think uh, that is a very nice closing for our uh, session today. I would like to thank all the speakers and panelists for their contributions, and of course, for the uh, participants, our audience who who joined us to this session, and of course, Maurice for uh, supporting us. 
in this session. And of course, also the team from the uh, Green Growth Week who have uh, supported us all this, all, all this week to um, yeah, organize this session successfully. Thank you very much. <laughs>